One of the hardest KSP challenges is to land Kerbals on every single solid planet with no specialized landers, just one single spaceship. You know part where like small engineering challenges decide to make an all-included party and it usually does not go really well. Making specialized spaceship, space plane or lander on board of a mothership is relatively easy. Combining all the various conditions for every planet in one vessel is way harder. I'm talking about single ground tour vessel that is not skipping either Eve or Tyler. In this video I showcase starship design that are able to operate in very different environments. This starship should have enough control in atmospheres of Kerbin, Late and Eve to secure landings on Tyler and Moho's ship needs big enough trust to weight ratio, good enough specific impulse to make an interplanetary transfers and orbital injections, and once you add like several Kerbals, big SRU and various utilities, there are like extra 10 to 15 tons of stuff to carry around Kerbal system. And to make my life even harder, this vessel have no launch system on Kerbin. So this is not a space shuttle, this is not even a space plane. This vessel is an SSTO or, well, SSTA which is an official holy grail of Kerbal Space Program, a single stage to anywhere. Although this starship is capable to land anywhere with no staging, nevertheless EVE atmosphere poses an extra challenge and requires staging to escape back to Kerbin. So technically it is single stage to anywhere, but several stages to return back from infernal atmosphere of EVE to Kerbin. And surprising enough, it is pretty dumb starship. Why is dumb? Well, watch the video. There are a couple interesting low-touch solutions to challenges of this grand tour. This video is not only a mission report, this is a tutorial and guide of this craft. Craft that is publicly shared, so everyone can fly own missions and dissect engineering behind this baby on its own. Calculations were tight, testing was daunting, but flying and sharing this mission is the ultimate reward. This would not be my KSP video without naming this vessel as something truly cringe. So rejoice, Starship transport in Kerbal system. Sounds normal. Uh, not really, let's shorten it up. It simply short stinks. I bet spending some time on a grand tour will make those air filters a bit smelly and stinky. Smelly or not, this craft have started as an elegant space plane and slowly devolved into a pretty dumb starship. So let's start by analyzing this engineering journey while actual grand tour journey is on the background. First thing to go in the elegant space plane were Raper engines, since they provide just nothing of value outside of Kerbin and Lathe. Taking a big SRU for a ride at an extra mass. And this was the first reason why wings just did not make it into a final design. Wings are just a bit on a heavier side and add nothing of real value for majority of the mission. Wings add extra complexity of horizontal landings. Wings require more moving parts and benefits are not so seductive. On the SRU side, one can use smaller refinery and smaller drills. But this will need either decades to refuel or time warp exploits. And this mission honestly is about beating KSP-1 in a proper manner with minimal amount of gameplay trickery. There is no real game design tricks outside of fuel tank clipping. And even then, this is more of my construction technique to get like specific visual look than anything really game breaking. Kerbin launch is probably the most important part of the mission outside of EVE escape and late to wall transfer. If you can launch from Kerbin as an STO and still reach either Man or Minmus, you have enough Delta V to just barely do every intermoon transfer in dual system. Very good indicator. Fuel margins here are rather tight, and launch profile does not like any deviation. And while Minmus is very tempting as the first destination, it is not always the best first destination for a grand tour. Initial prototype required proper alignment with Minmus. Minmus burn can be as low as 950 meters per second, but extra angle can add over 300 delta V for a burn. Initial designs were landing on Minmus with proper alignment with only 20 meter per second left. But after redesigning engine layout, I was able to just squeeze enough delta V for man landing as the first stop. And as you can see, this landing was relatively close. Nevertheless, if you have better piloting skills, you can have up to 100 meters per second delta V left. And this apply pretty much for every landing during this mission. My piloting skills are definitely not something to brag about. I just tend to overcompensate with engineering part. Logistic-wise, this man landing would play a pivotal role further down the mission. But first, let's talk about propulsion of this vessel. Balancing engine layout on this vessel was a pretty interesting engineering challenge. On the one side, nuclear engines are the best ISP engines in the game, but they are quite heavy and have a dreadful trust to weight ratio good enough only for places like Minmus, Bob, Paul and Geely. They can work on bigger moons and planets as a means of descent, but for an ascent of fuel starship extra TVR is required. 
At the same time, vector engines are complete opposite with very powerful trust weight ratio. Vector engines have insane attitude control, but they are not really so efficient when it comes to ISP. Aerospike engines are better, but not so powerful and lack attitude control just like in nuclear engines. As you can notice, Aerospike engines were placed pretty close to bow of a ship. First three iterations of this vessel were actually a virtual space plane with three vector engines. Two vectors on the stern, one vector with hinge in the bow cargo bay and two fixed nuclear engines in the stern cargo bay. This design can work, but it requires a lot of extra balancing and hybrid burns are funky at best. Also, cargo bays add an extra drag that makes EVE a real struggle, so unless if you are bringing like propellers to EVE, there is no real reason to bring a space plane with a cargo base. So exactly at this thinking point, I just scrapped the whole little idea and just force craft into a vertical landing on every single destination, making it simpler and easier to fly. Speaking of easy landings, as you can see, vessels slow down with an atmosphere on Duna. And I just literally dumped down a belly flop maneuver. Starship require quite a big control surfaces alongside with a careful mass balancing on top of like fancy calculations. But why not have like fancy computers with advanced avionics when you can just force mother nature to do all the dirty stuff for you? Just use something as dumb as a parachute. Our brave Kerbal now spilling cask and cordon jamsy use shoots to orient Starship vertically. Four shoots is a bit overkill since like even a single parachute is enough to orient Starship pointy and down. Uh, no, 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 wait a second. Play me and down, point and up. Yeah, as you can see, even like when I am doing voiceover, I am also confused. So yeah, this landing was like confused landing. The parachute drag do all the belly flops that you will ever need. And the rest is pretty much up to like vector engines, RCS and Mark 1 eyeballs. And after very, very normal landing, I just take Kerbals for a walk with a lander can hatch as an access point. This starship can bring along three Kerbals for a ride if it is not going to stop at Eve. So this can be totally like scientific mission, not just a doing like grand tour challenge, but actually something useful. Initially to repack shoots, I was planning on the ladders extending all the way up to the bow of the ship, but then I thought like, why to make like all, all these extra moving parts when pylon cask can just go for it anyway and just repack shoots once in orbit. So, with Duna landing secured, we can just start climbing towards Jewel with first stop at Ike. So let's resume the engine talk while I'm securing landings on Ike and my favorite destination, Dress. Why on earth aerospike engines are all the way near bow and not near the stern? The reasoning is pretty simple. Aerospike engines are the second stage for EVE Ascent. Bow of this starship is the second stage on EVE, but this is not the only trick in my sleeve to beat the last destination. Actually making aerospike functional during the whole mission was the most important part for downscaling this vessel from like 500 monstrosity. Although like first four iterations were only like 200 tons, fuel margins and TBR were just too close for my comfort. So instead of like two vector engines in the 200 ton variant, I opted for a total of four, which in turn allowed increased amount of air spikes from four to six. And with only 60% fuel capacity increase, I achieved way better trust weight ratio for initial carbon launch and final ascent from EVE. <laughs> Landing sequence in this grand tour allowed to avoid necessity of gravity assist for the first half of the mission. Simpler approach is always the better one. First destination in the dual system is Lathe. Injecting Starship into Lathe orbit is an easy task with all the Delta V at hand. Once again, just like on Duna, Lathe atmosphere do majority of slowing down and parachutes or in craft for a vertical landing. As you can see, this Starship is more like a control brick with ability to make a minor correction during gliding. It is not space plane, it is a flying brick. Literally. And there is no runway to land. At this point, I totally started to ignore vector engines as viable source of landing thrust. Vectors are nice to make like a good kick when you launch from Kerbin and Lathe. They are nice to land on Tylo and bleed excess speeds in other cases. But for landings in the low gravity or under effect of atmosphere, they are just too powerful and manually handling them, not the best experience. Launch from Lathe to Wall is one of the most tight places in this mission. One can really like opt for just a pit stop at Bob or Paul, while I just prefer a bit of a challenge climbing from the closest jewel moon outward into space. During this transfer, not a full oxidizer trunks are required. This vessel just needs a bit extra vacuum delta V to land on Val, while ascent from Lathe require a bit less oxidizer than on Kerbin. Extra delta V requirements for the most part are there as a result of very bad, 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 beer bad, or just bad. Yeah. Bad. <laughs> Wall and bad is just like tongue twister in this script. I don't know why. 
Right. Trust the weight ratio on wall, val, val. Ah. Right. Um, 400 milliliters of coffee later, I can now talk about wall and bad things and not bad things. So, trust to weight ratio on wall is just in this bizarre spot where, like, nuclear engines are not really good enough, but everything else is just not at your disposal after ascending from late. So, first thing first, I just inject my starship at very low altitude orbit, and then I start doing a landing burn. And this burn is a bit counterintuitive. It is done with a dynamic angle. My TVR is starting at 1. Uno, один, ну вы поняли. Which is adequate only for rapid disassembly if approached with the standard methods. So instead of that, I am killing my horizontal velocity while maintaining relatively low vertical speed. Reducing horizontal speed results in high effect of gravity on the craft and as a result higher angle of attack to compensate and align both forces. This is basically a method to land craft from a low orbit with very low TBR. If you are killing only horizontal speed from the low orbit, you will fall down with very high vertical speed achieved from the gravity, speed that cannot be dealt with your low TBR. And if you account for the gravity and start from the high orbit killing horizontal speed first, you will fight the gravity for very prolonged time due to the low TBR and use all the available fuel before securing your landing. This approach is the best of the two worlds. You fight vertical speed for shorter time span, descending from the low orbit. But as a trade-off, you are just fighting horizontal speed for just a bit longer time span than usual for this orbit. And in a true Kerbal fashion, wall landing is secured with over 5 meters per second of delta V left. Just look at this like over-engineering things. Definitely budget is going not where it's supposed to be. After making wall stop, it was time to go for... Tylo. Yeah, the most daring challenge in terms of the gravity. And if for wall I was relying predominantly on nuclear engines, high gravity of Tylo demand from this vessel good TVR supplied by vector engines. For majority of escape from wall and for majority of Tylo injection I am using all extra liquid fuel that I can. So once the time come, I am free from that weight of liquid fuel and have only normal rocket fuel to deal with the final bits of landing. For majority of descent I am using aerospikes as more efficient engines. Nevertheless, vector engines used in short bursts to bleed off excessive amount of horizontal speed at altitude checkpoints. Also using vectors in bursts allow to avoid instability since this vessel is not completely balanced for such a powerful propulsion in vacuum. And with quite fashionable zero fuel left, tile landing is secured. With three large moons conquered, it is only a matter of time before Jewel 5 is done. Escaping from Tyler is always way easier than landing on actual rock. Bob and Paul are very tiny moons and only their like irregular orbits have some sort of a challenge. And since this starship have all the delta V in the world, I just went for a both landing in true Resonanto fashion with straight direct to surface burns. And speaking of Resonanto, so there would be a torch engines in KSP2, there would be a new node system in KSP2, and we can actually paint MCRN colors. Why not? I bet they will actually have some funky reference to Epstein Drive or something. In any case, like using something more than like Mark 1 eyeball as a reference is always better. Alright. Completing Jewel 5 had its like tight moments, but actually next part of this mission is a bit harder. <music> Due to various environments, Jewel 5 is hard from engineering and piloting standpoints. Ilu, Moho and Eve require very careful logistics. Ilu is pretty far away and proceeding from Ilu to Moho would require gravity assist from Kerbin and Eve. Going to Ilu is pretty straightforward. Only issue is irregular orbit that makes uh, any transfer a bit longer than usual. If timed correctly, you can trivialize Ilu transfer to the same level as Joule transfer, with only exception that Ilu does not have any like big gravity momentum to slow you down. And if you are already in Joule system, you doesn't need a lot of delta V at some points of Joule year. I was a bit late, so mission was prolonged for an extra orbit of Joule, but it can be shorter, for sure. Elo have roughly the same size as Man, so one can land this craft in similar nuke-only fashion. But thanks for a good amount of spare delta V, I am doing my landing under power of aerospike engines with very small vector bursts. And after Elo mission, we need to go way back into inner Kerbal system. Obviously, it requires either an enormous amount of delta V, either solid heat shield to break from EVE atmosphere, or some sort of like reverse pit stop. Sinx just does not have enough delta V, and heat shielding is a bit questionable to survive like 3 to 4k orbital speeds. As you can remember, after initial launch, Sinx was able to get to MAN. 
which is pretty important for this part of Grand Tour to avoid any unnecessary repeated landings. Minmus is still available for a landing. Minmus is perfect middle spot to get from Elo to Moho. Not only it possesses very low gravity to maintain high delta V for Moho injection, but it also orbits Kerbin, which in itself provides huge gravity assist to slow you down even without aero brake. Launch from Elo was done under minimal amount of oxidizer power, and any unnecessary oxidizer was just dumped once in orbit. With over 6k delta V in Elo orbit, it is very easy to get to Minmus. With very inefficient burns, I was able to arrive to Minmus with over 1k delta V left. Refueling at Minmus require full liquid fuel tanks and just enough oxidizer for safe Moho landing. Initial testing showed that I need around 3k oxidizer to land on Moho. So getting around 4k oxidizer to orbit would cover even my bad piloting skills. Moho injection is one of the hardest things to do in like low TVR vessel, but at the same time enormous amount of delta V for orbital injection can be scraped off with the several gravity assists. As I'm aware some players were able to reduce Moho injection in half by doing like multiple gravity assists from Eve and Kerbin, Eve and Kerbin, Eve and Kerbin, Eve and Kerbin, Eve and Kerbin. For this mission, one Hamble neck from EVE is more than enough to change an orbit and reduce Moho injection burn by 500 meters per second. After Moho injection, it is possible to achieve very low altitude orbit. And just like real life Mercury, Moho is a desert rock with very low mountains stripped off of any valuable materials by a Kerbal radiation. So the landing is just killing horizontal speed and leaving enough altitude to orient craft perpendicular to surface under the effect of gravity. Launching from Moho is pretty straightforward and next stop is Gili. And I'm not going for Gili as the last stop and this is for the most part due to like not really so great heat protection of this craft. It is rather great for something like Duna, something like Lathe, Carbon, but not to the level of surviving unpowered descent into EVE atmosphere. For this reason, I want every bit of delta V in if orbit to control my descent. Gili being the smallest moon in the Kerbal system is the best thing next to an asteroid to get your fuel. Also, Gili pit stop allow for very easy orbit inclination change. If I remember correctly, if rotate very slowly, so getting to equator is not as important as getting landing site high above sea level. So for this reason, I am changing my inclination to negative 24 degrees. And once in EVE orbit, it is time for sweet and tasty part of this mission. Considering density of EVE atmosphere uh, and the actual weight of nuclear engines, there is no reason to bring them all the way down to the surface. Sting separate nuclear engine block with several fuel tanks. This is not only provide propulsion, but also have enough spare fuel to get small escape vehicle from EVE orbit to Kerbin. Descent is done retrograde to kill at least 1k delta V. As usual, all testing was done on other install of KSP. Install that does not have all the fancy clouds and you can actually see where we are going. So there is like this spot that I call Mount Everest, no pun intended. It is more than 7 kilometers high and provides incredible advantage for return to orbit. Nevertheless, could not see anything and absolutely missed everything. I feel like I was able to land just in the middle between every mountain range in the area. Uh, well, at least I can test Sting's capability to launch from low altitudes. And as usual, four shoots is more than enough to orient Flamy and down. However, even six aero spikes is not enough to slow down to a reasonable speed. So I activate vector engines with action groups for a short burst to bleed off last bits of speed. Once on the ground, I deploy all the usual things. As you can notice on every single landing, I was deploying custom braking system. And EVE is not an exception. Uh, the system consists from two service modules attached to hydraulic lifts. And there is like this KSP tendency for everything to slide around except several exclusive parts and interactions. And very high gravity of EVE just multiplies said sliding effect. Cargo bay doors and service bay doors are one of those indestructible parts that also kill any sliding with a reasonable way. This is like one of the reasons why I'm actually such a huge fan of bottom facing doors on my space shuttle and SSTR designs. Not only it's very good for the VTOL placement, it also provides craft with anti-sliding ability, which is like win-win-win. Not only it is good to drop your payloads, good to place your VTOL engines, but also provide craft with anti-sliding ability, which is like win-win situation. Nevertheless, this system that for the most part was designed for the slopes of Mount Everest, yeah, it just, well, just broke. Yeah, kind of, you know, you design something for something specifically and it just break in the last moment when you're doing the final thing. Yeah, it's kind of sad. But well, since we are not on the slopes of Mount Everest, there is not a lot of places where this thing actually can slide to. So it just found, you know, the nearest stable point and just was sitting there. 
All right, so next step is the launch preparations. And they are not like really very intuitive. I do not fill up the full tank since liquid fuel without oxidizer is a dead weight. And I have quite a bit of liquid fuel tanks uh, in the Everson part of this craft. Next on the list I adjust fuel flow priority, so even with enabled cross-fitting decouplers, both part of the craft will maintain fuel levels until the end. This was done not only to make my like engineering part easier, but also to reduce part count, since in this manner I can just delete a dozen of fuel pipes. And at the same time I was also able to avoid unnecessary bow heavy car for majority of the mission. So it's kind of a win-win situation, uh, good balancing and less parts, just need to adjust fuel flow on the EVE surface. Next on the list is to actually make decouplers to decouple manually. And they were actually removed from staging not for the sake of KSP gameplay, but since probability of my cat hitting space key is just too high, my cat just loved to shield me from this like, you know, this square contraption showing moving pictures. And this process obviously involved like excessive purring and stomping on my keyboard. So yeah, enough cat talk. Time to launch. Obviously there is no reason to lift refinery, drills, majority of liquid fuel tanks, landing gear, antennas, almost half of the oxidizer tanks, you know, like a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, like fuel cells, a lot of stuff. Landing stage have quite a lot of stuff clipped inside. And as everything we see in this mission, launch went a bit sideways, like literally. Probably like the assembly of braking system messed up with some internals and Kraft was able to escape from landing stage after like several seconds of grinding. Uh, when you ascend from the EVE sea level, there is no like real reason to go at any angle, so one can just adopt radial out stability assists. Vector engines do the most important dense part of atmosphere, and once out of the fuel, bow section with six arrow spike engines turn into the main ascent stage. Bow section of Stinks still retain some RCS control, and two control fins also help you to slowly start gravity turn. Once proper trajectory outside of the atmosphere is achieved, it is time to lose the pairing and reveal the final orbital injection stage. And for unknown reason, actually I mismanaged liquid fuel levels, but well, even with this like extra weight, the whole system is still functional, so probably going from like sea level is still viable as well if you like manage levels correctly. Uh, the command module itself has almost 2k delta V to achieve the circular orbit. And both nuclear engine block and command module have two RTGs each, so they are both independent and can run duo with each other. Docking is a bit tricky, but if you align both docking ports and maximize docking acquire force, it is like completely doable. And after that, cabin return is like, you have a lot of delta V. I don't mind with very inefficient burns and went for direct aero break since I still have like more than 300 delta V left. And this also allowed to slow down craft even further before the hitting actual atmosphere. And even then, like nuclear engines are pretty much a sacrificial lamp for carbon reentry instead of like your standard issue heat shield. And yeah, like there is totally nothing wrong with melting and jettisoning nuclear engines high above residential area in the middle of the night. As you can notice, capsule itself have a single parachute to land, and fuel tank is actually not a fuel tank, it's amortization and disassembly tank. So yeah, this is not explosion, uh, this is actually a functionality built into the spacecraft, so once it lands, it actually automatically dislodged and prepared to be sold like multiple parts to multiple collectors. It's completely intentional. And also at this point, like, I have noticed like one small thing, like, like yeah, 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 uh, why? <sighs> I just forgot to transfer Pillon Cask from lander stage to command module on EVE, so I just left him stranded on a purple planet. Yeah, that's kinda noopsie. <laughs>